evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Melanie Korn, and I'm the president here at Columbus College of Art and Design. Thank you so much for coming to CCAD tonight and joining us for the second event in this year's President's Lecture Series. I'm thrilled to have acclaimed ice cream entrepreneur, Jenny Britton Bauer, here with us tonight. But before I introduce her, I want to tell you about a few of the other exciting events that are coming up here at CCAD. Tonight, after our conversation, we will have a reception out uh, in the atrium, and I hope that you will stop in and check out um, some of the work that is up in the Biela Gallery. Currently on display, we have the MFA thesis exhibition, uh, so it's a really fantastic show, so take some time to check that work out. And as you may know, CCAD this year is celebrating our 140th anniversary. So we have been educating talented artists and designers since CCAD's founding in 1879. Uh, and as we celebrate our 140 years, we have a number of events throughout the year that are highlighting that legacy of creative excellence. Next month, two of our big annual events, Chroma, Best of CCAD, the 140th Annual Student Exhibition, this year presented by Ohio Health, and the 2019 CCAD Fashion Show will highlight our 140th anniversary too, with Chroma happening on Wednesday, May 8th, and the fashion show happening on Friday, May 10th. If you have never been to either of these events, I would encourage you to come. Chroma, in particular, um, is a free event happening here on campus, and it is a really fantastic exhibition of all kinds of student work. Um, in addition to being able to roam the halls of many of our buildings and seeing the excellent work of CCAD students from all levels, you'll also be able to hang out on the quad, hopefully, knock on wood for some good weather, um, enjoy a pop-up fashion show, um, I believe a CCAD Comic-Con of so sorts? Chromacon, sorry, yes, a Chromacon, uh, and you know, have a drink, get some great food from food trucks. I hear there might even be some Jenny's ice cream. So, um, so come back uh, for that event, and, and I know you'll all enjoy that. We will also continue to celebrate our 140th anniversary this fall with more events in the President's Lecture Series and a new project that we're calling Grads in the Galleries, celebrating 140 years of creative excellence where galleries from around Central Ohio and other art institutions will showcase work from CCAD alumni. So more on that to come, but I hope that you'll um, take many occasions throughout the fall to visit our uh, amazing uh, art scene here in Columbus and check out the impact that CCAD art students have had on that. Be sure to pick up a calendar of events outside here. Um, also, of course, everything you hear can be found online uh, at ccad.edu slash calendar. Um, and all of this programming is possible thanks to the support from our partners. I want to just thank them tonight, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, the, St the Skestos Endowment Fund for Visiting Artists and Lecturers, and CD1025. CD now, one last plug before I introduce tonight's speaker. A lot of our support from these various funders is based on data from events like tonight. So be sure to please grab a survey right outside this door and fill it out if you haven't done so already. It's a quick and easy survey and helps us um, give information back to our funders to let them know that we um, have crowds showing up and who those people are. Um, so we can continue to great, uh, bring you great uh, free programming here at CCAD. So to introduce tonight's speaker. I first met Jenny Britton Bauer not long after arriving at CCAD, and I was immediately impressed by her enthusiasm and, even more importantly, her deep understanding of the role of the arts in both growing creative entrepreneurs and turning a city from livable to lovable. Jenny has been making ice creams professionally for two decades. Before that, she studied art, worked in a bakery, and had a serious hobby blending perfumes and collecting essential oils. Jenny founded Jenny Splendid Ice Creams in 2002. Her ahead of the trend vision, using whole ingredients and dairy from grass pastured cows rather than synthetic flavorings and commodity ice cream mix, coupled with inspired flavors, sparked the artisan ice cream movement more than a decade before it would become a top food trend. Jenny also, I am happy to say, serves on the CCAD Board of Trustees. And she is a James Beard award-winning author of three cookbooks and has been recognized by Fast Company as one of the most creative people in the business. Following her talk this evening, be sure to stick around for the reception, as I mentioned, and 
a book signing, where Jenny will be signing copies of her latest book, The Artisanal Kitchen, Perfect Homemade Ice Cream, The Best Make-It-Yourself Ice Creams, Sorbets, Sundays, and Other Desserts, as well as her 2011 book, Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams at Home. And thanks to Gramercy Books, who, make, uh, who made this book signing possible. And now, please join me in welcoming Jenny Brittenbauer to the stage. Always the, gotta negotiate the seating arrangement. You sit there. Okay. I went around. We, we didn't do it the way we were pre planned. <laughs> so, thank you again for joining us here tonight. Jenny, we know you, of course, from your ice cream, from winning the James Beard Award for your first book, and for your travels documented on your incredible Instagram account. But what we will know, but what will? This is the question. But what will we know about you in the near future? What's next for Jenny? Well, we are in um, April, <laughs> and sometimes I have to remind myself of that, but that means summer is next for me. And, and for us um, in um, our, our world, um, winter is about almost like a weird hibernation. We kind of go in, um, identify the stuff that we thought went wrong last year, um, identify things that we want to do new this year, uh, from flavors to art, um, training, service, just all sorts of stuff, stores. Um, and then we get to work to, you know, it's really a race to the finish line, um, like March 31st is kind of our finish line to get that done before we pounce on summer. And that's, that's where we're headed at this moment. So for me, I'm in this transition period of like shaking off that sort of hibernation to get back out. Uh, we've, we've made these incredible flavors this year that we're really excited about. We have this new dairy-free line that's like supremely addictive even for people who love dairy, which is like I think the first time in the entire world that's ever happened where like a dairy person who loves dairy ice cream will actually choose a non-dairy ice cream. And that's been really awesome and exciting for us to watch. So that's being sort of released through the summer and, um, and lots of cool stuff. We have a bunch of stores opening up this summer, which isn't... Um, common for us. We've opened only a couple of stores a year for the last couple of years and that's been awesome but, but we're gonna bunch it up a little bit this year and I'm sure come fall we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of work to do and <laughs> be ready to pass out for a little bit maybe yeah I'm a, t I'm a person who likes near goals yearly goals I look at season and like now and then very long vision um, and not much in between <laughs> What's long vision for you? When you think about the far future, what are you what are you envisioning? I envision. I used to envision forty five, but I'm here. So <laughs> um, now, but 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 I actually think also like my my really long term vision is like ninety five years old. You know what I mean? What am I going to look like, and what am I going to talk about when I'm ninety five? You know? And I hope it's really interesting and really fun. And um, you know, I'll be sitting on my porch, my rocking chair, or whatever. So I imagine those adventures that I'm telling other people, and then I go make them happen while I'm here and young. Yeah, awesome. So um, one of the, one of the conversations that you and I have had before, and uh, something that's come up, you know, during board of trustees meetings, um, is something that you talk about quite a bit, which is which is grit and and stick with itness. Um, being an artist or designer is not always an easy choice, um, as many of our students and alumni in the audience can attest to. What advice would you offer our students and recent alums as they encounter the anxiety, fear, the real roadblocks in their career pathways? Um, it, I just no. It is it, it is anxiety and um, fear sort of inducing without question, and we work obviously with a lot of artists in just on my team um, because you're putting yourself out there and because you're putting your your, your yourself into it. And, and just you know, putting it on the table and allowing people to tell you what they think about it. So just by nature, that is um, a scary thing to do. And it is every day still for me. And I think, it's, I think everybody on our team would still say the same thing as well. And I think, I, think that, that I think a lot of jobs are like that. I think life is like that too. And, um, and I always think about um, you know, um, the, the difference between your adventure and, your, and, and a real crisis, you know, because sometimes it's confusing. You know, it really hurts to get up the mountain, like it's supposed to hurt, like it's a, like it's you're supposed to fall off, and like it's 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 supposed to hurt to get up that mountain. And uh, but that's how you learn too. And when it's when you're scared and when it's sort of causing that, I always feel like I'm probably in the right place. You know, I'm doing something I should be doing. I'm, I'm pushing myself to 
do whatever it is that I was freaked out to do. Um, but also, the other thing you have to realize, I think, is that it never goes away. Like, it never stops, right? So in so many ways, like, that's the game, right? That's the thing that we have to just, we get better at being afraid, in a way. We, we, we get up that one mountain that was hard to get up, or whatever, that caused so much trouble. And the fact that we did it was so exhilarating when you look back that you then have to find a bigger mountain, right? And you get yourself in more trouble. And then you're just like, why did I do it? My team, I mean, Danielle's here tonight, she's seen me in this place many, many, many times. Um, uh, every year, where I'm like, why did I decide to do this, you know? Um, but I just, I feel like that's the thing. It never goes away. You're always, you know, but pushing yourself in there and when you know that when it's causing that, you're probably, you're probably in the right, a little bit on the right track because you do build endurance to that. Not, um, not that that goes away, but you build endurance to feeling that way. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great way to look at it because I think, I think we, are, we often um, have this sense that you know, fear is something that we learn to overcome, you know, that, we, um, that we, we expect to kind of deal with these things and then success is no longer dealing with them. But I think your point that it's not as though you don't feel fear the next time, but it's about sort of learning the skills for, for working through that fear. Um, right, and those skills for me for working through fear are like go get in my car and turn on um, Metallica really, really loud and then get up and do it again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So it's not, it, it, you know, the skills sometimes are just, um, you know, you, you, um, you, you have that relief at the end when you've done something or, in, you know, whether you fall or whether you get over that hump that you're going. And then, um, and then you push yourself again, and you've got to get um, prepared. And I think you know we all find our ways of doing it. But and if you and, and and again, I think your point that if you're not feeling that fear the next time, then maybe you should be questioning whether or not you're climbing a big enough mountain. Yeah, I think yeah. so. It's fun to be at the bottom of the mountain, looking up, knowing that you have this challenge and adventure in front of you. And it's it should cause some pride too, because that's when other people turn around. Everybody else will turn around when they hit the brick wall or when they when they start to feel that way. I can tell you that being 45 years old and seeing it happen so many times, and there are only a few people left at some point, as if you keep pushing yourself, right, to get over it. But that is the thing that I think all of us deal with. I think we all often feel we're the only ones dealing with them. It really, um, really isn't that way at all. So, most important question of the night: which Metallica album? <laughs> all, all of them, but it's really like song by song for me. <laughs> okay, all right. I guess I'll I'm a don't tread on me person. Like if there is um, something happening or whatever, <laughs> I'll put that on. Like blow my eardrums out and go do it. <laughs> <laughs> so as we've been talking about, it hasn't always been easy for Jenny's. You've dealt with your share of setbacks and challenges. And other than sort of learning to roll with the fear, what are some things that you've learned from your biggest challenges? I think your challenges sort of solidify, um, I think they sort of solidify your value system actually. And, and you, um, you kind of believe you know who you are before, you know, just in general, I think. And, and, you, and you build that as you grow. Um, but I think the big, huge challenges are where you, when you get tested and you hold those values um, um, true, then, then you, that's when you sort of really know who you are, I think, deep. And, and also for us, our company and the people we work with. Um, but I do think that I do think that that crisis makes people better, you know, and um, more interesting. And um, you know, there's just something that it does to you that makes you just more open to the world. And and, and so it's something that I feel like uh, you don't wish it on anybody, but it, but at the same time, it kind of makes you. So, as a child, you attended CCAD's Saturday morning art classes. How does art, um, how has it, how does it now inspire your business? My grandmother was an art teacher. And so I spent a lot of time in her classroom after school. When I lived near her, and I moved almost every year growing up, so I didn't always live near her, but, um, but she was awesome. Her name was Enid. Both of my grandmothers passed away last year, actually. And my other grandmother, two very important people in my life, Betty. She, um, she was kind of a scrappy um, just woman. She was awesome. And um, she had this sort of entrepreneurial spirit to her. And so Enid, as an artist, always said she didn't want to make the same thing twice. And that you couldn't, like you weren't supposed to ever pay. If you offered Enid money to do something for you, she was repulsed. Like she wanted to do and express herself in the way that she wanted to 
do when it's your child, and complete freedom. And then, uh, but so she would always be searching for something and new to do, or whatever. So we were always working on projects, and always. So she would research how Native Americans made baskets, and then we would start pulling cattails out of the ditch, and she, we would dye them, dry them in the sun, and make baskets out of them. But then I would take all of this, so we, we made all sorts of different things, you know, knitting and weaving and just all sorts of projects. And I would take that over to Betty's house, and Betty would just be like, well, wait a second, why don't we make 20 of these and sell them in the neighborhood? Which was great, so we would do that. And I loved the idea of making 20 identical whatever it was, and I really grew to love the idea of process and um, of taking what Enid would, would, she would learn what she learned from that, and then she would um, do something new and different from that um, knowledge and experience that she had. But I wanted to build, if I had 50 of the exact same thing and they were exactly the, exactly the same, you couldn't tell them apart. And if I had three of my friends helping me with them and you couldn't tell theirs apart from mine, I felt like that was such a success. So it was just something that we did all the time and I feel like that sort of um, formed me as a person. But through Enid and her lessons um, as a, always, a, always a teacher, um, just looking at all, those, all the details, they had um, 10 acres of farmland or um, forest land and we would be out there every weekend and they had honeybees and maple trees and we built an authentic teepee uh, after we researched it for two years and figured out how to do it in the right way with a fire in the middle of it and like all sorts of my grandfather built a um, like a cabin like Thoreau cabin in the woods and um, and we had to spend two hours alone every Saturday that we were out there um, too in, in the woods but anyway she taught us to look at all the details and whether and with all of our senses and I feel like that is that sort of art thinking and understanding how things are affecting you and being aware of those and then being able to translate that and communicate that out into the world. And I feel like that's the lens, that my first lens that I go through every day. So what did you sell besides baskets? Oh my gosh. Um, sweaters, but like but like little sweaters, like dolls. <laughs> um, 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 oh, I mean, eventually lots of things at school, like pixie sticks, I figured out that if you could that you could you could get Kool Aid and like mix different flavors and put it in the food processor with sugar, make really fine sugar that was like pixie stick dust. And so then I would fill up straws by like just rolling paper and making a um, funnel and filling up straws by like the hundreds. I mean, I sold a lot. I had people, salespeople. Um, but I mean, I was always in trouble for doing that. I was always in trouble. We moved every year, as I said, and so there was always some principal that wasn't happy with me for all the things that I was selling. Like recess, and then if I didn't, have, if, some, if I had a friend who had a different recess, they'd be selling stuff too, and I'd go home and make it every day after school, and there was all sorts of stuff. What did you do with your earnings? Oh, we went and bought pizza or something like that. I didn't, I mean, I never saved it or, you know, nobody ever told me what to do. I mean, I just would, would buy more stuff to make more stuff and then we would eat pizza. <laughs> so my background is actually art history and, um, you know, one of the things I think that is a real shift uh, in contemporary art practice is that looking back art historically, most artists weren't telling their own stories. It was, you know, art historians years, decades, centuries later who told their stories. And that's really changed. And so I think you know, one of the things that is particularly interesting to our students up here is how well you've told your story over the years. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about how you've built the narrative of Jenny's as a brand throughout the years and how has that changed? That's, that was so, that was easy and, um, and I, I it's interesting you say that because I would I would look back and say, gosh, I don't think we were very consistent, but I'm looking at all the little details. But but it's not true. I mean, you know, we my story is the North Market. It's the story of the community um, that I learned about flavor, and um, and and growing from there and meeting farmers and fellowship and 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 all of the things that we shared in the market and that just grew from there. And that that's an authentic story of how our company came to be. Um, and there's so many lessons that were learned from there from entrepreneurship and, um, and all of the business lessons, but also just from a purely, you know, just ingredients point of view, flavor point of view, seasonality, display, all of those things. I mean, community and humans, um, the things that I learned and, and preference for people, you know, that people had for ice cream and flavor and just listening to people. But I feel like everything we do just goes back to that place and that like family thing that we have there at the market. So how did you, I won't, I won't ask you to repeat your whole story about the, the origin of Jenny's ice cream, because um, I know you've talked about it before, but can you talk a little bit about um, that moment where you, um, where you first 
left the market, and what what was that experience like? Like the, uh, when we first opened outside the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was interesting because, um, well, first of all, we fought really hard for the space. It was it was our Grandview location, and we fought really hard to get that space. And they weren't very excited. To, it's it, they weren't very excited to give it to us. I mean. Um, Landlords are not easy to convince um, that you're the one that they should take on when you don't have much of a um, background or you know you don't have a lot of proof um, that it's going to work. Um, so we, you know, it took a long time. But we finally got them to agree to let us in, and we were so happy about that and so excited. And it was a perfect location. And we really wanted to make that community excited about us. I had seen that location since I was in high school. I used to ride my bike over to the coffee shop over there or stops. And like, I mean, I, I grew up watching that. And I knew what had happened with other owners of that space. There, were, there was the guy that made sandwiches that sat outside and smoked the whole time. And you just felt like, who wants to go in there and buy it? Like, he's not being friendly. So I was aware of like what was making these people fail. You know, like for some reason that spot always failed. It had failed since I was in high school and now we're in 2006. That's, you know, a long, more than whatever, a long time. And, um, uh, and I felt like, um, uh, we were going to make it work, and and so what we did was we we decided to kind of make it more historic, and so we, we tore out the whole front. We didn't have a lot of money to spend on space. We put everything pretty much into the front, and made a new storefront, which is really cute, and and has like a little jewel box sort of place to sit. But it was really like we thought. Actually, you know, I saw it. If we totally bomb here, it's going to be um, we will have we it'll, we will have created something nice that like somebody will want to keep that will feel kind of historic and we dug down and saw the the, the tile in the place and so we kind of replaced it with or that had been there uh, previously generations maybe before and so we kind of replaced it and um, it sort of went with that historical grand view look anyway I felt like the community really responded to that and um, and it was that extra mile was that sort of detail thing that the community responded to and that was what I think made us a success there when for years and years, nobody had made it. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think you know that that ties uh, really well into my next question, which is about, um, which is partly about Columbus. So, you know, Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream is an, is an iconic brand. Um, so, even though again, you may not always feel that your narrative is um, solid, I think that it it is. It is a very iconic brand. It's a brand that represents high quality product, cutting edge ideas, and the pushing. Um, of people's expectations in so many ways. Um, but one amazing thing to me is that no matter where you are, I've seen many people claim that Jenny's is their hometown uh, favorite. Um, that Jenny's, I think, quickly becomes a part of the fabric of the community um, of many different communities. Uh, in fact, I, uh, one of my cousins lives in Nashville and my parents were driving through and spent the night at, in, with, with them in Nashville and they were showing my parents around Nashville and they were like, oh, we wanna take you to to, to Jenny's, it's you know, it's a Nashville, uh, you know, icon, and, and and this really great ice cream. And so my parents go, and my mom, who's very proud of me, and maybe I bragged a little bit about you being on our board. <laughs> she really was very pleased with herself that she could remind uh, my cousin that in fact Jenny's is from Columbus, and that. Jenny actually is on Melanie's board. Um, so she had a little bit of a moment of motherly pride. But um, <laughs> but I, I guess, you know, how have you done that? How have you made Jenny's become um, part of the fabric of so many communities? And, and what role do you think art and design plays in that? Because I feel like there's part of it that is about, about the, the, that creative foundation. Of yeah, Jenny's. and communication. It's funny because we didn't do any of that on purpose. I mean, I'm very proudly from Columbus. I tell everybody, um, about that, we have uh, posters that, that talk about Ohio and our farmers and all that in our stores. And when I've been down there and people say that to me, I correct them and they're like, oh, we don't care. <laughs> like, it's almost like we're like adopted locals. And I think that's because, um, I do think that our design played a big role in that. I think that, um, I think it's that, um, I mean, first of all, we do all of our design in-house. It's never perfect, although getting better and better all the time every year, but like that was the thing. It was just like, we do it uh, because we are the right ones to represent and talk about and communicate what we do out to people, whether it's how we photograph our ice creams or how we write a, a tagline or a headline or how we write the flavor tags or any number of those details in our stores. We do them. I often do 
some of that myself, even still to this day, I mean, even like pint design and pint writing and all that stuff. And I think that it makes a difference. I think it makes a difference because it feels like every single word is the right one, at least for us. It may not be perfect, but it's like, you know, it has that sort of character. And, um, and there's something that feels a little bit handmade or homemade to it as well. And, um, and uh, or made by us, you know, not sleek, you know, or too slick. And there's something about that that feels that people connect with, that um, is very human, and, um, and and I think that that's it. And then of course, just service. I mean, I think we, um, I, we, we just love our community out in our shops. I mean, I think we have 1,200 people now that work in our shops, and um, and that's that's an awesome, awesome thing. We get to go out and train a whole bunch of people with their first job each year. And, um, and that's so fun. So we really value our communities, we value service, and I feel like people feel that. And then the people who work in our companies feel that from the company they work for, this sort of love that we have kind of going around or whatever. And like, I don't know, there's just something that it all kind of comes together and doesn't feel like it's overly produced. Yeah. My, my very first job when I was 14, I believe, was at a local ice cream shop uh, in Gurney, Illinois. Uh, and Gurney, it's north of Chicago, about 45 yeah. miles north. It's almost Wisconsin. Yeah, right. That's like Wisconsin. Still Illinois. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's up in the suburbs. Um, but you know, it's uh, it was kind of, I mean, it was good and I didn't, it was sad because after, you know, this sort of little small town ice cream shop was there for a couple of years, it couldn't make it. And then the next summer when I went back to work when I was 15, I worked at the Dairy Queen, which was now where the old house we did is uh, used to be. And so it's pretty magical that, you know, that you have been able to persevere and grow. And um, and that's definitely not something that happens every day, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so you, you recently said um, that uh, rule breakers are the new rule makers. So what does that mean to you? I think it's true of always. Rule breakers are rule makers. Yeah. Rule breakers are rule well, you makers. said I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah. maybe not only true. No, right. <laughs> um, if I had followed the, I mean, even now, um, established science and know-how of ice cream and ice cream manufacturing and, and even business, we wouldn't be the company that we are. Um, you know, people said a lot that you couldn't do it to me, and in, especially in ice cream, you know, not using stabilizers, um, a whole bunch of different things. And I just like, you know, as usual, had to like learn that myself. Um, and a lot of times when people say that it won't work, it actually doesn't work. But sometimes, if you're the kind of person who has to figure it out on your own, um, sometimes it does. And, um, and I think that's true of how we've done our business, and I think it's true of how we do ice cream, by taking milk apart and putting it back together in a certain configuration. Um, but, but our business, I mean, our business is a fellowship. Our business is a, is a whole bunch of people working together, bringing them, their whole self into it with their skills and their perspectives and, and, um, and coming together to make something different than all of us, you know, bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, how we do that is not something that you would ever do in business. We would never create a business like ours if, you, if it was your business school project because it's too complicated. Um, it doesn't make sense on paper. And, um, and yet to us it does because we just started it, we just did it, we believed in it, and we kept chipping away and figuring it out and finding efficiencies where, they, where it existed and you know, we figured out how to make it work. Um, but I think that, so, so, I remember, so I know that if you just keep going and, and finding those and discovering things on your own, you do find those, those places. And it is about you know, not taking uh, anything at face value and often that feels very much like you're you're like breaking the rule or you're you're you're, you're not going with it yeah. and we broke all the rules of ice cream so besides not using stabilizers what's what else what other rules did you break well um um i mean just every fresh strawberries like you can't take fresh strawberries from a farm and put it in your ice cream that way you will, and if you can do it for ice for one flavor you can't do it for 10 flavors um, <coughs> Uh, you won't be able to use your own chocolate. Like you can't, you can't go directly to a chocolate mat, like a chocolate grower. You have to use the like chocolate paste because otherwise your ice cream will be off balance and it won't work. I mean, every recipe that we have, you know, you can't make caramel on a, on, at scale because um, nobody does and nobody can. Well, that's true. Nobody does and nobody can except us. Now, you know what I mean. Um, but it really is like every flavor. Um, 
uh, my book, um, I, I asked some of my science friends, scientific, uh, the, the professors at Ohio State, um, the ice cream scientists over there, um, like to help me. I was like, I want to, I know we can make a better at home recipe um, than has ever existed because the only books out there have the same creme anglaise recipe that's been around since like, you know, the Middle Ages or whatever. And they're all within, you know, an egg yolk of each other and a little bit of sugar, right? So they're all very similar. I know we can do better than that for home cooks and I know we can get closer to like what we're doing. And they were just like, nope, it's impossible. You won't be able to do it. It's, you know, all of it. went down every path I could find over there just to see if somebody, even like a grad student, would want to dive in and help me with this project. And so I had just had Greta and she and I were home and um, I put her on my back and I just started like make an ice cream at home on um, small ice cream machines. So using the limitations of a home kitchen. So working backward from the body and texture that I wanted to create at home on this $49.99 machine, I wanted to give people the flexibility to make whatever flavors they wanted to and to freeze it solid in your home freezer, bring it out and roll it into a ball like you were haagen -Dazs, you know? I wanted everybody to be able to do that because it's super fun and not have to worry so much about the ice cream science. Anyway, we ended up doing it, it was great and, and all of that, but, but just like um, if I had taken all of the literally top experts in America, if I had taken their advice, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be sitting out there ready to inspire all you guys to make ice cream. Although there is something still fond childhood memories of the slightly salty because the salt got into the maker vanilla ice cream that's simultaneously melting before you can eat it and so cold that you can't possibly get it in your mouth. Yes, no, I completely agree. <laughs> I mean, I'm just such a huge fan of ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> ice cream. Yeah, and I'm not a, an ice cream snob either. I have my, the, my ice cream that I do that exists in the world, but it's for sometimes and all the other, yeah. other I know all of them. <laughs> so as I've mentioned, you're a board member at CCAD. So what do you think that educational institutions like CCAD can do to best prepare creatives to succeed in a world of creative entrepreneurship? I think that entrepreneurship is a lens through which you can see the world. And I think that, um, I think a lot of times we look at it as a discipline. So we teach it like, you, that we think we can teach it like science or like math or any number of other things. And really um, it's more of a, an encouragement you know, because whatever it is that you're good at, whatever it is that you're passionate about, whatever it is that excites you, can lead to a business. You can make a business off of that. And, and so you have to study, you know, science to do that. Or, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're a doctor, and you're the, but you're the perfect one to come up with that next medical innovation that becomes a business. I um, mean, art is a great way to um, just to sort of see the world as full of opportunity where, you know, your sort of creativity can meet what sort of the community is looking for and then there's that sort of commerce element. Um, but I think it's a, um, it's a lens. So I think it's like, and, and, and how can the community use that? And where's that? And, and always remembering that sort of humanity sort of aspect of what it is you're doing, whether you're studying science or art, how can I create value in our community with this? Because too often, I do think that we think about entrepreneurship and we immediately want to, you know, teach finance or uh, executive leadership or whatever. And I don't think you need to know any of that stuff. In fact, I think it's the opposite of what you need to know because you bring people in like that uh, who are very, very important for your fellowship. Um, but but they need to be almost like the opposite thinker of you, which is what I have with John Lowe, and we are so, so good together because we have that we come from opposite points of view. Um, whereas like mine is all about passion and community and build, you know, building community and product and all of that, and looking at the vision and future of what we're making, and he's looking at organizational structure and efficiency and all sorts of other things, and it's really cool how we can work together. But the real entrepreneurs, and I do think that we can do better in Columbus on this front, and I want to, um, uh, you know, we're going to. Um, I think to build entrepreneurs, it's just like we, we, we just start nudging people wherever they are and, um, and, and really starting with kids too. So um, I, one more question for me and then uh, plenty of time for questions from the audience. So think about what you want to ask. Uh, so I'm a mom and a spouse and a college president uh, and it's not Oof. always easy to balance all those things. Um, and I know your life isn't very different from that. Um, so what is it like being a woman in leadership? Um, what are the struggles? What advice would you give to the women in our audience who want to run their own business um, and also have a family and everything else they want to do in the world? 
Well, I think being an entrepreneur is a, is a, is a strange thing. Um, um, you know, they always say that entrepreneurs build up, you know, you jump off a cliff and build your parachute on the way down. So that is very accurate, but the other thing that you do is you take everyone in your life with you and um, they don't have a choice. You know what I mean? If they're with you, if they, they stay, if they choose to be with you, that's, that's what's happening. Um, there's something about that kind of passion, when you're sort of following a passion, I mean like real passion, I mean, I think artists are like this too, and they're, um, but if you remove it from me, I'm no longer me. And so I'm not good at, I wouldn't be good at doing anything else. You know, I mean, anything else, I wouldn't be a good mom if I wasn't able to do this. And so it's a, it is a part of me that's so deep and that can't be removed. It's, I don't see it as a job. And so therefore, when I think about balance, it's just all in, you know? Um, but for me, it's being honest with everybody. You know, as honest as I can be and open, whether it's with my um, husband, um, who's a really good supporter, um, and, and also my kids now. I mean, they're they're ten and eleven, and they're they're thinking human beings, and they're awesome. And I can we can I can involve them and, and everything. But it's um it's a lot. I know. I mean, it's a lot. And I think it's more for women. I think it's a lot more for women. And I think we realize that, but uh, it's not always obvious to our partners. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. Um, Thank you for that, for all that. Uh, and I want to open it up to the audience. Who has a question? Jenny. Great. We do have a couple of mics. So we've got a, we've got a um, good crowd here. So let's, let's use the mics. Hey, Jenny, I like your, I love your, love, love, love your ice cream. I'm not sure Wait, this is on. Hold on, that's not on. Is that better? Ooh, yeah. It is. Um, I'm really interested in when you scaled your business from Grandview and then was it the short north? I'm in a huge growth um, phase right now in my business and I, it, the scaling part, like how did you get your team? But um, I mean, so that was going to be my first. I hope you have a really good team. Um, how did we get our team? I mean, the, the number one, the first thing I, for us was, um, well, I knew I was gonna, I knew I was gonna bring a CEO in very early in our um, life. I mean, you know, in, in the life of the company because I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what I needed to do. And I also looked around me and I was like, Charlie's not doing that and Tom's not doing that. My, my brother-in-law and my husband, um, it, they were both awesome at other things, but not in terms of like organizing the company. Um, and bringing uh, that knowledge from, you know, that knowledge into the company. Um, so that, to me, was really, really important. I cannot imagine scaling our company. We went to, I think, four stores when John joined. I can't imagine doing that without his help. It was one of the lucky parts of my life. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard that story. We both like to tell it a lot, but I mean, you know, we were drinking buddies, and um, Charlie and John and I, and um, he was like our attorney friend. And, uh, but we knew him really well. We knew he was a community-spirited uh, leader, and that was really important to us, and he would get what we were doing. He did get what we were doing, and so we, um, we just thought about that a lot and tried to figure out how we could really earn his you know, participation in our company, but he was really excited to join, and it's a whole story. But to me, that was, um, to me, that's kind of everything. You don't get to do that unless you, know, unless you, unless you can really attract that team, and there's a whole bunch of ways of doing that. Um, you know, but that's essential. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. What advice would you give to uh, me about securing my place in the future, whether that's in art school or in an art-related career? Um, well, I think there's a lot of different careers in in art and art related uh, in the art that world or whatever. Um, let's see. 
I think that when we're when we're looking at, especially in a creative sort of, I actually don't like the word creative. It really bothers me because everybody's creative. Like art doesn't own creativity, and it, and I say this constantly because my team is like the creative team. There's our creative director Danielle. Um, but, but it bothers me when I say a creative career, and that's just kind of a side thing because we're all, I mean, the best of people at anything are creative and creative thinkers. Um, but anyway, in that sort of art, um, I guess kind of more, some, sometimes more emotional sort of, in a way, work and career. Um, something that kind of helps me, and I don't know if this will help you at all, but when I go into like uh, uh, what I want to do in the world, uh, just whatever, and there can be small small things or big things, building a career, building um, a project or whatever. It's sort of like, I get my ideas, and I think there's only three outcomes. Like, I'm right, they're right, or both, right? It's like, um, you know, there are certain things that I want to dig my heels in, there are other things that I want to really listen to people and adjust and completely do a complete turnaround. And then, most of the time, it's like a compromise. So. Uh, for me, it's always about what am I doing and, and what am I doing right, and always about listening to other people. I don't take advice very well, but I listen really well, right? You know what I mean? I don't know if there's a difference, but to me, I make it, I differentiate it. But that idea of like, if it's not working, what is it that's not working? Like, am I right? Are they right? Is there a compromise I need to find? Um, that always, I don't know, that just always works for me. Two hours. Two hours, rather. <laughs> Every Saturday. My um, my grandma, my grandfather was very into Thoreau, and my grandmother was very. In, they were both into self reliance and all that stuff too, and like just all sorts of things. And uh, and she really was into reflection. And I think it was everything for me. Actually, it was. I mean, there's a lot of things for everything, but I think about that time a lot. I hated it at the time. And, uh, but in the morning, we'd wake up at four in the morning to go out and we would eat pancakes with our maple syrup and our blueberries. And I always packed my backpack and I packed what I needed for those two hours. And I went, I always went to the same place. We all did, we all had our place in the forest. And I went to the old oak tree and it was original growth. I mean, it was a massive oak tree with like, I could sit in the, um, uh, the roots and they were moss covered and amazing. And I was convinced, 100%, no question, probably till I was like 13, that there were gnomes living in, there were like humanoid creatures in the tree. And so I always had a tape recorder and a sketchbook. And I thought um, that if, for, I would always turn on my tape recorder, just in case anything happened. <laughs> and um, I really thought that if I could like, if my energy could match the energy of the tree, that they would come out to me. And I knew I was going to be the only full-size human to ever experience that. <laughs> With, and I had no question that this was true. And, um, and so when I look back and I think about even things like my scent bank that I have in my memory, um, working with scent as long as I have, a lot of that comes from that place, you know, what the forest floor smelled like in each season and what those tactile things are in the forest. It's still my favorite, like just my favorite place. And when I'm, um, have, when I'm struggling or if I have like anxiety or whatever, that's where I go. It's important and it's hard as parents to make your kids do that, you know, but it's so wonderful. I have um, a question later that I'll ask you about Metallica, but for now, <laughs> I was just wondering how you pick your ice cream flavors and which one of your, which one of Jenny's flavors is your personal favorite? How we pick them, did you say? Yes. Um, so we have a test kitchen and we're in there all the time making lots of different stuff. Um, we often look at, well, we definitely look at what people like, you know, what we've put out that people like. So um, 
we're working on those, we tweak those often based on our own preferences, the preferences that we're hearing that people like. We always put out a few every year that are just ones that I like or um, the ones that, the stories that we're kind of interested in telling um, that just sort of more than sort of challenge you or something that's adventuresome. Um, and then sometimes it's just like what we're craving or what we just know is going on. There's a lot of, you know, pop culture or um, history or whatever, or whatever all it is, and ingredients, you know. Um, but it's a very small group that ultimately makes those uh, decisions and, um, and then we put it out, we don't overthink it, we listen to what people say, and if it's popular, we try to do it again, and if it's not popular, we try to figure out why. And a lot of flavors, like um, like Orange Blossom, Buttermilk Frozen Yogurt, for instance, which is one of my favorites, isn't necessarily our most popular flavor, but I am absolutely stubborn about it, so it'll be, it'll show up anyway, and it's really beautiful, so if you see it this year, you have to buy some, so we know. I can convince my team that it's, you know, the right way to go still. Um, so it's just kind of like a, a fun group of people working on them and deciding. And definitely like, if you like a flavor, buy it because it won't go away if it's popular. <laughs> so here first, you had your hand up and then back here. Um, I'm a high school librarian, so I was wondering what book do you think that all high schoolers should read? It can be like, you know, classic or nonfiction or something, but I think like times are changing and classics we kind of need to, I mean, that's my opinion, but I would like to see more nonfiction like entrepreneurship or business type books that they might help them succeed. Oh gosh, my first went, <laughs> I first went to King Arthur. Uh, which is like, I always think that, um, I always say that my favorite business book is the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, <laughs> which is just, that will illustrate what I think about, you know, how business people work together with um, the sort of fellowship and community builders and like the passion people or whatever. Um, but uh, I did read King Arthur and I really like King Arthur and I think there's that something about um, the round table that really, I don't know, that still resonates. I'm not sure it resonates with high school kids now. Got it. But, um, um, the Four Agreements, I think every high school kid should have. And um, anybody remember who wrote that book? I think it's great, it's easy to read, and it's like, it does, it does, it's not everything you need to know about life, but it's a pretty good foundation, and it's just four. Nobody told me not to, so that was something that I'm realizing that's very, very important. Um, I had an idea that I was really excited about. I was way more excited about it than school, and um, and uh, in fact, I don't know. I like I was sitting in a figure drawing class, and a model walked in that I always had just trouble drawing, and um, she was very tall and thin, and like I had trouble with her angles, and I like to draw things like really big, and so I like that sort of. Um, more round, and um, and I was just like, I have to sit here for three hours, and all I want to do is make ice cream. And so I got up and left, and I left everything there, and I just knew that I wasn't going back. I think that if I had people in my life who uh, were protective of me at the time, which I didn't really, um, they would have encouraged me not to do that. But nobody did. Everybody was, you know, I just did it because that was what I wanted to do. And. Um, and there's something to that, you know, you, you make those big decisions and then you take responsibility for them. Of course, my first business failed. I mean, there were a lot of really great things that happened there and a lot of learning and um, it was such an important part of my life, but, um, but it, and it was better for me than, than school, actually. I mean, but I did love school. I went to Ohio State and I really did. I, I wasn't really on a degree track anyway. I was taking whatever I wanted to there and even like popping into other classes and uh, listening to those. I mean, I was really just doing whatever I wanted. I mean, I took a class on vampires. <laughs> and the French, the great thing about, especially when they were on quarters over there, is like, there's a lot of options. So like, I was taking, you know, uh, the currency between Athens and Sparta, you know, just one class just on the economic, you know, relationship between Athens and Sparta. I mean, it was just so cool. Like, it's such a neat environment. So I wasn't, you know, all the people that were trying to help me were like, the, the counselors or whatever were like, like, you need to focus. And I was having a lot of trouble doing that anyway, so. 
I think it was just that I had an idea and I wanted to see if I could make it work. Yeah, that's interesting. If I if I didn't have Jenny's, would I, I, because I had that sort of entrepreneurial thing going on, if I didn't have Jenny's, would I be an entrepreneur? So when I graduated high school, I actually wanted to be um, a makeup artist for like monster movies. <laughs> I wanted to go work at, on like Star Alien movies, like Star Trek. I wanted to work. For, I actually wanted Picard. And um, Wait, did you say you wanted to work for Picard? Picard. <laughs> um, and I, so I pursued that for a while, and I think I would have actually been all right at it, and then I ended up wanting to go to, to university. And, um, and I think I could have ended up, I think I would have ended up with my own sort of shop, you know, at some point. I think that was always my goal, trying to figure out what I really was so passionate about, what I really loved, that I could do on my own. I don't think that I work well with other people, or you know, for other people. I just, even though I've always loved having a job, always, I mean, since the early days, I was always so proud of that. I mean, I worked at Graders, actually. It was their first employee in Columbus, and I had absolutely loved it. I loved the freedom that came with that. And I, and I, and I actually feel like it's weird because high school kids aren't getting jobs anymore. I mean, we are a place where they could work. They're just not, and it's just such a loss, I feel like. Um, but anyway, um, but I just, I think that that was the thing. I just, I like to, I like to, to play around and like try things and have vision and make things come to life too much. So I think I would have always had to have my own business. Mm -hmm. Right here in the middle. And then in the back. And then we'll probably wrap up there so we have plenty of time for a book signing and reception. Hey Jenny, thank Hi. you for the dairy-free chocolate. Love it. <laughs> um, what new thing are you learning or trying to learn now and what's your process for learning that? New thing? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I'm like, I'm still trying to learn ice cream. And definitely like, we're working on the non-dairy stuff, and I don't know if you're asking me like if I have any hobbies, because the answer is absolutely no. Um, I still draw a lot, but I don't draw for anything for real. Um, but I draw for like relaxation and to think. And I always am trying to get a little bit better at that and painting. I paint pictures of my kids a lot, and that's sort of fun, like moments in their lives, and I think I am trying to get a little bit better at that, because I think, they actually look better than pictures, or they actually say more than pictures. Um, so there's that. I'm looking forward to a time when I can spend more time. I don't know. Sometimes I think I want to build a car, you know? Like that's something I'm gonna do in my life. You know, I'm gonna learn how to do that one day. <laughs> Thanks. Jenny, um, I'm curious about dead ends with flavors. So you come up with these wonderful flavors and I'm glad to know that you know, you're know you paying attention to what people really like. I know you had some flavors long ago that I really liked and then I didn't see them anymore. I guess they, they weren't as popular, but what, do you come up with flavors, profiles, try them out, try them out, try them out, and they just don't work to your satisfaction and we never see them? The problem is there's just endless um, potential for a flavor and ice cream. Ice cream is really about scent and you can layer so many scents on top of each other and then there's texture and all this stuff. So, I mean, you really can make so many things into an ice cream. There's so many ideas. Um, and so um, partly I think it's just we want to move on a little bit. We want to find, the, we want to pursue the next idea. And then, and then of course, partly it's the ones that people love. We have, we have like room for new stuff we have room for um seasonal stuff and then we have like our um signature flavors and that that really kind of don't change very often and then so the, the the experimenting and whatever you know that's like one slot that we get to do throughout the year and uh and so i don't know i don't know so we're just constantly kind of working on that and there's always something new that we want to try and there's just not enough room to do everything which in a way is one of the reasons that i wrote the book so that i can because there's i mean you know, when I'm at, you know, CBS or something like that, and, and somebody's like, um, excuse me, you know, um, you know, in 1998, you made uh, whatever flavor, and people remember them. It's really cool. Um, you know, um, 
you know, whatever, uh, you know, then I can say, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get that back, but I'll give you the recipe and you can make, you can make a pretty good rendition at home, um, which has been really fun. Mm -hmm. So, um, how many of you, by show of hands, have, this is, how many of you is this your first time at CCAD? Awesome. Well, I am so glad to have all of you newcomers here tonight, uh, and I really hope that this will be the first of many trips back to campus um, to see all kinds of exciting events like the one we had today. Gotta come to the fashion show. Gotta come to the fashion show. It's awesome. It's like, it just feels campus. so good. It's and Chroma. Cool. Mm -hmm. Chroma, yeah. So come back May 8th for Chroma, for Chroma, May 10th for the fashion show. Chroma, open and free. Fashion show, you gotta buy tickets. They're still available online. Um, Jenny, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, as I said, just out here in the atrium, we will have a reception, and um, Gramercy has two of Jenny's books uh, that you can purchase, and Jenny will be happy to sign them. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll even give you recipes for whatever ice cream you want. I can just freestyle it. <laughs> thank you.